everyone. It's wonderful to see you, and I see a couple of guests, so I want to introduce myself. I'm Jan Eller Isaacs, one of the ministers who has the honor and privilege of serving the congregation here at Unity Church. Um, we are here in part because we have been inspired to invite Stephen Jonasson, who we love to have on a regular basis, by the newly formed Denominational Affairs team. Uh, a group of people who are seeking to um, strengthen our bonds with the larger movement, but also to help remind us of our evangelical roots. Unity Church has a, had a long history of helping inspire growth and, and to nurture Unitarianism, because we were initially a Unitarian congregation. I want to remind you that White Bear is not our competition, but is our satellite. Uh, our satellite. <laughs> and uh, I would not have said that. But thank you for the inspiration, my love. Uh, but I I claim uh, a mothership rights with the. Uh, with the White Bear Congregation. And, <laughs> um, and we want to welcome any of you who are here from other congregations. Uh, I hope you know what a delight Stephen Jonasson is. Once we get him plugged in, sometimes it's hard to uh, pull the plug because he has so many stories and so many insights. And he came a year ago and all of us in the room wanted him to go all day long because he is inspiring with his knowledge and his stories and his sense of uh, our call to nurture this faith here within the walls of this congregation and outside its walls. So Stephen Jonasson, who is a large church consultant serving the UUA and also is a consultant for uh, growth strategies. So Stephen, Welcome, we are thrilled to have you. Thank you, Jan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I need to make the page go the right way there. The, uh, actually, you know, White Bear isn't your satellite. White Bear is your fully grown, responsible, mature, well-educated, well-acculturated offspring. <laughs> but not your first. I come from your first uh, offspring as a congregation, which is part of the reason why I actually as, have been as curious and interested in the history of this congregation as I am. Uh, because I am the product, the child of a congregation that this congregation helped to plant in Western Canada uh, well over a century ago. And so I feel a particular affinity. This is, uh, in a very real sense, uh, the mother church of Unitarianism in Western Canada, uh, which is probably not a role that you're particularly conscious of on a regular basis, and not even necessarily one that you would want to report to the NSA as being among your achievements. Uh, but it's a fact of your history. And so I, I'm just going to kind of romp through uh, your, your history from uh, beginning to not the end, uh, from beginning to the present, uh, and, and tell you, uh, share some vignettes with you. Uh, but, but I'm going to start by actually offering you some themes to consider as we go along. Because I think that there are a series of themes that come out of your collective story that are uh, recurring explanations for why it is that you uh, behave the way you do as a congregation, for good or for ill sometimes. But, but th there are these recurring themes that, if you will, are part of your DNA as a congregation. They are fundamental to who you are. They began to form very early in the life of this congregation and have been reinforced with each successive year. And to the extent that a congregation might well be a mothership uh, or, or a, a mother church for others, this also tends to be DNA that you send off uh, to those uh, other places in the way that any good parent would. 
uh, and and uh, help to, to nurture a particular way of being a liberal religious community in the world. And so I want to just name a few of the themes. I think that one of the characteristic themes of the history of, U of Unity Church is theological innovation. Uh, this might sometimes be read as theological gadflyness in, in any particular time. That that a curious thing is that this congregation has tended to occupy the tension between where Unitarianism and subsequently Unitarian Universalism's heart is in a particular moment and where it might yet go. So that there has been, I, I, I'm reticent to call it a cutting edge quality, but there has been a tendency theologically for this congregation to push on the limits of what is comfortable and accepted uh, in the larger Unitarian Universalist movement when it comes to theological questions. And that takes a different shape in different eras. When we, when we uh, go back to the 1880s, uh, you were, were actually the most threatening church to, to uh, the grandmother church in Boston of any congregation in the association at the time uh, because of the theological innovation that found its heart in this congregation. At other times, that theological innovation has looked like a conservative trend, I think mistakenly so, uh, because what it actually has been has, has been a demand for theological depth in periods of our history when theological depth was not actually viewed as particularly desirable in the larger movement. So the apparent place you occupy on the spectrum, the theological spectrum, if you can imagine such a thing, might have varied over the years, but you, you have represented that kind of creative, healthy, theological tension uh, that, that has helped our, our uh, movement advance uh, in terms of its spiritual traditions. The second observation I would make about this congregation has been throughout its history, it has been a place of, of liturgical renewal. Uh, even though you've uh, sometimes had a curious uh, take on liturgical questions as well, uh, this has in fact been a, a congregation that has had an impact on the liturgical life of several other congregations uh, throughout the association. And that's a distinctive piece of your tradition. Outreach to non-traditional constituencies uh, has been in the DNA of this congregation almost since the beginning. And I will share with you the, the story of your congregation's relationship with two of those non-traditional constituencies in your history, which will not seem so particularly non-traditional today, but I can assure you that in the, the closing decades of the uh, 19th century and into the early 20th century, it was an indication that this, is, this congregation, this polite congregation in St. Paul was associating with people that the other polite leaders of the community thought he would be best not to associate with. <laughs> this congregation has been involved in church planting, again from its earliest years, from years when this congregation scarcely had a couple of hundred members of its own. It was engaged in, in planting Unitarian congregations elsewhere. And of course, uh, one, one could argue, uh, I would argue for a wonderful congregation in another city, but one could argue that, that the magnificent congregation at White Bear Lake uh, is almost the pinnacle of your success uh, in terms of planting other congregations. Part of the, one of the characteristics of this congregation has been its uh, technological effectiveness. Uh, and, and that's been characteristic again uh, through, through your history and partly out of necessity. This was an outpost. I mean, this is, let's face it, St. Paul is as far west as New England comes. <laughs> and, and I mean, you know, you cross the Mississippi River into that other city that often gets named as, as being the capital of this area. You, know. you, you cross over into another city, you realize that you've kind of clearly shifted into another whole zone of experience in the world. But, but 
this congregation was kind of that far western outpost, you know, not, not including that other coast on the left-hand side of the continent. Uh, the, the, it was this far western outpost that had to communicate with the center of Unitarianism in very different ways than most members of the larger Unitarian communion. And so we don't think of telegraphy as being a pioneering technology today, but the fact that that was part of the, the early experience of this congregation in terms of keeping in touch uh, with, with its companion congregations to the east is something that became embedded uh, in, in the life of this congregation, I think, and has led you always to be somewhere close to the technological cutting edge in terms of, of utilizing the most current technologies available in order to do your work. There has, has been a waxing and waning societal engagement in the history of this congregation. There have been times when the congregation has retreated uh, to being an oasis uh, within the religious landscape, uh, a haven where uh, the peculiar people who associate with Unitarian Universalism could find respite from the larger world. And there have been other times where actually you have been out in the larger world confronting it face to face, uh, engaging in rich and robust relationships in that world. And that has tended to come in cycles. And one of the things that's probably going to become evident as we go along this morning has been that you're mostly famous for the eras when you've been engaged societally. Uh, and well, I won't say that you've been infamous for the eras when you haven't been, but you can go there if that's where your brain takes you. <laughs> Another characteristic of this congregation has been long ministries. Uh, settled ministers uh, come here and, and they retire from here. Uh, that wasn't true in the early years. In the early years, promising young ministers uh, came here to become famous uh, and then went on to better paying and more prestigious pulpits elsewhere. But uh, during most of, of the 20th century and into, it's hard to believe we're in the 21st century, at least it's hard for me. Uh, that that in, in your last century of history, this has been a place of long pastorates. And that is actually, you know, there, there are advantages and disadvantages uh, to that pattern. Mostly it's an advantage for congregations. One of the things we know about large congregations <laughs> is that they thrive with long pastorates and they tend to decline and diminish uh, when they have more rapid succession of ministers. So that's been one of your characteristics. And the final point that I'm going to, to uh, um, ask you to hold in mind as we go along, and this is the least flattering quality, uh, perhaps, that, that we, a characteristic that we can observe at several subsequent pieces of your history. Uh, but, but the last characteristic is that um, you have a repeated history of financial barriers delaying your next steps. Uh, that, that's the, the polite way of putting it, which is to say uh, you have a history as a congregation of becoming uh, financially anxious at critical points uh, in, in your journey. And it's actually, it, it's a story that's more than a century old uh, in, in terms of, of how your congregation has uh, progressed. And there's a positive side to that, of course. It means you're not reckless. You're not a careless congregation when it comes to, to stewardship matters. Uh, on, on the other hand, it probably is a manifestation uh, of a certain degree of a culture of scarcity uh, that has existed at critical points in the life of the congregation. Uh, and it is a part of, of who you are. We come as mixed packages, individuals and congregations alike. Uh, come as, as mixed passage, uh, packages, and, and there are these uh, noteworthy um, uh, characteristics that we like to hang out for everyone to see, and then there are the characteristics that might seem like you know, shyness if we put a positive uh, spin on it, or anxiety if, if we're not in such a positive mood, that are also a part of who we are as individuals and as congregations, and as they like to say, we just need to own the whole package. Because taken together, the whole package is glorious. Uh, the the uh, 
uh, story of Unity Church is a magnificent story. Gil Rendell, who was a senior consultant at the Alban Institute and is now the executive director of the Texas Methodist Foundation, uh, has long said that the primary responsibility of any consultant who works with congregations is to help a congregation tell a better story about itself. Uh, you have a pretty good story uh, to, to start with. And uh, as a consequence, telling a better story about yourself is difficult because you begin with a pretty good story, and yet that is the challenge of every generation, to take the story of, of the congregation it has received from those who came before and figure out how to utilize all the resources and the richness of its own heritage in order to tell a better story into the future. And so, I want to just bring you back to 1872 when a gaggle of about 50 people came together, signed a, um, a charter, signed a covenant with one another, selected a board of trustees. In the beginning was the word, and immediately after the word was the board of trustees. <laughs> and creation unfolds. And for a congregation that, among other things, has become noteworthy over the years for giving good governance advice to other congregations, isn't it wonderful that such a an august uh, act as selecting a board of trustees should be such a prominent feature in your early years. You'd actually been gathering for worship for a while. So, so a group of Unitarians had been meeting in this city, most of them from old New England, uh, many of them longing for home. Uh, one of them, a woman uh, who I am in love with. She died in 1918, but I am still in love with her. Uh, and and they, they gathered to, to uh, create this Unitarian outpost here in St. Paul, really not knowing where it was going to go, not having a real imagination for what its, its future potential might be, uh, but having a certain longing uh, for the liberal expression of faith, uh, what, what was then understood as distinctly liberal Christian expression of faith, uh, here on the edge of the known universe at the time. And, uh, and, and there, another curious thing about your history is that there only seems to be a delay of one to two years from something uh, noteworthy happening and then the next step of noteworthy occurring. So it took you about a year before you actually got around to formally incorporating. Uh, which is also probably an indication of that kind of organizational sophistication and care uh, that's, that's at the heart of your story. And you had a couple of unimportant ministers, well, less famous ministers, and then you got extraordinarily lucky in calling one of the ministers who actually represented the next big thing that Unitarianism was going to be in America, and that's William Channing Gannett who was born in Boston. He was the, the son of Ezra Stiles Gannett, who was the sainted Dr. William Ellery Channing's assistant at uh, what was then Federal Street Church. Uh, they've since moved to a new street and changed their name. But, uh, but Gannett was, was born there, a child of the parsonage. His, uh, his father, of course, became the first secretary of the American Unitarian Association. Uh, against his boss's better counsel, uh, since Dr. Channing himself had doubts uh, about either the need or the desirability of having such an association. But, but uh, you know, William Channing Gannett grew up in that environment. And as was often the case, followed his father into his father's vocation, almost. By the time William Channing Gannett finished his theological studies, he had grave doubts about his own suitability uh, for, for the ministry. In that, he was remarkably like a contemporary figure of his, Felix Adler, uh, who was, of course, going, Felix Adler was the founder of the Adler Culture Movement, and he was going to succeed his father as a rabbi in New York City uh, until the congregation determined that his theological heterodoxy uh, was, was too great uh, for that to happen. And so he didn't follow his father as a rabbi. 
founded the New York Society for Ethical Culture instead and made history. Well, curiously enough, William Gannett is a similar figure. He had grave theological doubts compared to his, his father, who was a pre-conventional Unitarian Christian. Uh, and and as a, he had become thoroughly Emersonian. So, so William Gannett absorbed uh, the, the insights of, of Emerson and, uh, and, and his disciples and sought unsuccessfully to reconcile them with Unitarianism. It was actually an impossibility on the East Coast to be able to do that. And so he, he actually uh, uh, came here warning you uh, right from the beginning that he might prove to be a grave disappointment to you. Uh, and in fact, deferred being ordained for an extended period of time um, because he was simply uncertain about this ministry business. Now, the result was your first era of blossoming. So, you know, unlike the synagogue in, in New York City that could have had Felix Adler uh, as their rabbi if they had had a more expansive imagination, uh, this congregation was willing to take a chance on William Channing Gannett's uncertainties and perhaps was inspired by his very openness. What a, what a refreshing breath of fresh air to, to have your would-be minister be very candid with you about his very doubts about even a religious communion as liberal as the Unitarian in those days. And uh, as it happened, uh, you, you all bonded uh, very nicely together and Gannett had a, uh, um, a significant ministry here over an extended period of time and really solidified your DNA as a congregation. This place became the cathedral of, of the Western Unitarian Conference. There were other congregations that aspired to that role. And certainly uh, Jenkins Lloyd-Jones, one of the leaders of the conference at the time, thought that the cathedral, the real cathedral, should be in Chicago. But it turned out that the place of theological, spiritual, and organizational insight for the Western Unitarian Conference ended up focusing here in St. Paul, which was towards the western fringe of even the Western Conference, because, you know, in, in the 1880s, the imagination of what West looked like uh, was significantly different than, than what it looks like today. And so Gannett really became, if you, if you will, the, the, uh, uh, the spiritual custodian of the Western Unitarian movement. That became uh, particularly uh, clear towards the end of his pastorate here when the so-called issue in the West was underway. The great controversy about whether Unitarianism could be expansive enough to include those who did not consider themselves to be explicitly Christian or theist. The great debate was whether it was simply good enough to aspire to be a good person and to come together on what was called an ethical basis in order to form a religious community. Gannett said, yes, of course. And, and then proceeded to write what was effectively the manifesto uh, for a more expansive understanding of Unitarianism. That manifesto, which came to be known as Things Commonly Believed Today Among Us, and which was passed by the Western Unitarian Conference actually a year after he left town uh, for a, a better opportunity, um, but which began to be crafted during his ministry here in St. Paul. Um, that manifesto, probably more than any other document in our history, is responsible for a separate Unitarian movement continuing to exist. You see, the, the Unitarianism of Channing is so easy to reconcile with the Congregationalism of, of America a century later, that I'm convinced that if nothing had happened after Channing, who I admire, I adore, actually, if nothing had happened after Channing by, by a century ago, there hardly would have been any reason in the world for the Trinitarian Congregationalists and the Unitarian Congregationalists to remain separate. And so I'm actually convinced that the two movements would have ultimately come back together 
And today, congregations like Unity Church would simply be part of the United Church of Christ. That we would have reconciled if Channing had been our last big quarrel. But those transcendentalists came along. And I need to tell you, they weren't good churchmen in the language of the day. They were, they were disruptive. They were socially dis destructive to harmony. Uh, in several of our uh, congregations, they opted out more than they opted in. And while Unitarian Universalists love to claim Henry David Thoreau as one of their primary theologians today, he actually willfully resigned uh, from First Parish in Concord and reflected the tendency of the Transcendentalists to actually stay away from Unitarians rather to, than, than to engage with them too closely. We were the best alternative option on the block, but it wasn't good enough. So, but, but their presence started to have a dramatic impact on the thinking of key Unitarian figures. And really by the 1860s, that had turned into something akin to full-blown warfare uh, in the liberal religious movement with the, the emergence of both the National Conference to represent the more conservative position in the faith, and at the same time the, the emergence of the Free Religious Association, which was broad enough to actually entice Felix Adler to affiliate with it uh, for, for a period of time after, after it was initially founded, but which consisted mostly of disappointed uh, Unitarians who had gravitated in a transcendentalist uh, direction. Uh, and we're trying to reconcile those, those two theological currents. The Unitarianism they had known and the transcendentalism that was changing hearts and minds. Gannett did it. Other people struggled with trying to figure out how to do it. Octavius Brooks Frothingham, another figure from our history whom I love, if only for his magnificent name. <laughs> Octavius Brooks Frothingham, who was the first uh, president of the Free Religious Association, had been unable to do it. Francis uh, uh, Abbott had been unable to do it. Uh, the, 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 the key figures at the time had just kind of been unable to pull it together. Jenkin Lloyd Jones, the magnificent Unitarian missionary, did what he could to, to reconcile the positions, but it was ultimately Gannett who was able, with the skill of a poet and the insights of a profound theologian, it was Gannett who was able to pull things together and on the one hand both express this idea of a more expansive fellowship for the Unitarian movement while still being able to speak in language that made sense to our religious neighbors. And he did it with that wonderful document that called Things Commonly Believed Today Among Us. They are mostly things that are not commonly believed today among us in 2014. Although I do sometimes like to say that, that I actually uh, think that we haven't done a whole lot to improve uh, on how we communicate ourselves since 1887. And I have a very radical cutoff point around 1953. So, you know, that's sort of the era that I dwell in comfortably theologically. And, and I believe that that document and, and what Gannett was able to do as a leader in the Western Unitarian Conference is in fact what secured a separate Unitarian and ultimately Unitarian Universalist movement into the future. If 1887 had not happened, if there had not been an issue in the West, if things commonly believed today among us had not been written and passed by the Western Unitarian Conference, your congregation today, if it were around, would be a member of the United Church of Christ. There would have been no reason to keep separate. And so that was a transformative moment, not just for this congregation and its recently departed minister in 1887, but it was a transformative moment for all of Unitarian Universalism in terms of carrying forward into the future. Now, one of the things that I particularly like about William Channing Gannett is that he introduced you to your neighbors. The, not only was he heterodox in terms of his, his theological beliefs, uh, but he was also prepared to hang out with Norwegians. <laughs> and, and as I talk to you about the Norwegian and Icelandic presence in Unitarianism, 
because you're going to hear about Icelanders before I'm done. I would like to invite you to think about the fact that outside of New England, the place where Unitarian Universalism is strongest in North America is where? Minnesota. It's not an accident. There are two things that have come together. One is, is that the Universalists managed to get it right in Minnesota, which actually wasn't characteristic of their story as they moved westward uh, during the course of their history. In most places, the Universalists succeeded in planting magnificent congregations for the Methodists. <laughs> <laughs> that they would move into a community, preach the Universalist gospel, win Methodist hearts, uh, and, and change Methodism. Uh, for the better, I would add, and the Methodists would inherit the buildings and oftentimes the ministers. Well, here in Minnesota, actually the significance of universalism in the emergence of Minneapolis as a city uh, and in the progress of this state was critical enough that there was a very strong universalist presence in this state that was uncharacteristic for places outside of New England. But the second characteristic is actually the willingness of the, the St. Paul Unitarians to reach out to the other uh, communities of immigrants who were coming to the state. In fact, many of whom had been in the state for years, for a generation or more already. And, and in this sense, there actually was a difference between the two Unitarian societies uh, in the Twin Cities area. St. Paul was much more engaged in interaction with, with the immigrant population, although they had some troubles in the relationship. So, for in, well, I'll get to the trouble in a minute. It's a curious story about your history. Um, suffice it to say that in 1881, Christopher Jansen, who was one of the four uh, poet laureates of the Norwegian nation, uh, came to North America as a Unitarian missionary. He had been persuaded by his friend Rasmus B. Anderson, who was a professor of Scandinavian studies in Madison, uh, to, to take on a liberalizing gospel among the Norwegian immigrants uh, in, in this part of North America. And he made a great sacrifice to do it, because as a poet laureate of the Norwegian nation, one of only four, uh, Christopher Jansen had in fact been given a lifelong pension to do nothing but write. And so he could have spent his days back in, in Norway, or, or as, as he did later on in Denmark, uh, just doing what he loved to do and receive a magnificent government salary uh, to be able to do that for an extended period of time, but he resigned that. He became so convinced that the plight of the Norwegian immigrants in, in the area from Chicago to the Twin Cities was so desperate because of the growing conservatism uh, of the Norwegian churches here that someone needed to come west to rescue Norwegians from themselves <laughs> theologically. And he felt called to do it. He was a rather unconventional Unitarian minister. He was given to spiritualism, uh, actually married some spirits uh, out in Hanska, uh, where he was the summer minister for about a decade. Uh, which wouldn't have been at all embarrassing if he hadn't tried to enter the marriage into the parish register. <laughs> but he, he was a curious figure, but he was a distinct religious liberal. And his great companion in the early years of the journey was William Channing Gannett, who, for reasons that I can only attribute to Gannett's character, was not offended by the fact that the American Unitarian Association was paying Christopher Jansen twice as much as you were paying William Channing Gannon. Uh, was not offended by the fact that, that, uh, uh, that the, the uh, American Unitarian Association paid for Christopher Jansen to have two maidservants and a personal secretary in his home in Minneapolis and William Channing Gannett had a women's alliance uh, to, to do that work for him. Notwithstanding the fact that, that, that Jansen was prospering from this arrangement and Gannett was kind of working with you hard to keep up with 
salary demands for himself and to create the resources necessary to build your first building, that magnificent Queen Anne-style structure that you first worshipped in. Notwithstanding all of that, Gannett was actually a great and enthusiastic supporter. What he understood was that if Unitarianism was going to thrive in this part of the continent, it was not going to do so on the Boston model. Unitarianism was going to thrive by becoming relevant to the new groups of people who were coming into this territory. It was going to thrive by reaching out to the very people that everyone in Boston knew were not available to us. And in those days, it was Norwegians. You can name who those folks are for Unity Church today, but in those days, it was Norwegians. And Gannett was bold in supporting the Norwegian Unitarian mission in in frankly encouraging the American Unitarian Association to be generous with it, even when that association was being far more generous with the immigrants than this congregation could afford to be with its own minister. I think it speaks to Gannett's character. It also speaks to his vision, that he understood that religious community was an evolving phenomenon, and that you had to be in relationship with your neighbors, you had to be, be able to, to uh, build new relationships with new neighbors as they came in, and that the future of our faith depended upon it, and that it was actually possible to imagine a Unitarianism that was not only theologically different than the Unitarianism of Boston and New England, but which was also significantly culturally different. And to that, I think we owe the fact that initial appeal to Norwegian immigrants in Minnesota. To that, we owe the fact that Unitarian Universalism is as strong in this state as it is relative to other places. The work began early, and while it may not seem obvious, because, you know, people don't tend to wear their Norwegianism uh, on, on their lapel pin, except at the Sons of Norway meeting these days. <laughs> Uh, the, the fact is, is that it, it changed the nature of how Unitarians interacted with the larger environment in a way that was unimaginable uh, back in the cradle of our faith in New England, but was perfectly natural and also vitally necessary here. And so he engaged in that. There was a stumbling block, though. I suppose I should uh, point out that, that Gannett also wrote the wonderful sermon called The Church the Home Beautiful, and then The Church Beautiful. Um, it was a, a series that, that there were like lots of beautiful things to Gannett. Everything was somehow beautiful. Uh, and it affected actually the decision about that Queen Anne building you made. The, the reason that, that your first building rather looked like a home was that that was actually Gannett's imagination for what a congregation could be like. But in the basement of that home, on Sunday afternoons in the 1880s, after worship had been completed with the regular congregation of Unity Church, the place filled up with Norwegians who came to hear Christopher Jansen. And that went on for an extended period of time. I mean, Jansen would preach at Nazareth Church in Minneapolis in the morning. He would board the train. I just, I love this image. He would board the train and travel all the way to St. Paul. He's, what is it, 12 miles? <laughs> travel all the way to St. Paul to conduct a, a, uh, uh, a Norwegian Unitarian service among the immigrant community in this city, which was small. So, you know, it was, was a, a smaller phenomenon. And that went along very well until the trustees of this congregation discovered that they were playing dancing music in the worship services at the, the Norwegian service, and the Norwegians were invited to leave. Did they clap? <laughs> Norwegians, Norwegians would clap. <laughs> they, they might feel inspired to clap, but their better natures would kind of just hold them here. Just one second to talk about that church, that Queen Anne church. It was uh, for some time across the street from a bar. And uh, one of the things that the congregation did is they had uh, a, a keg of water 
that they would place outside the, the church and invite people to come and partake of more nurturing spirits uh, within the walls of the church and to have a refreshing glass of water. So. <laughs> and, and they're actually... Uh, the, the people of Unity Church and Christopher Jansen would be in harmony. Christopher Jansen had enough spirits uh, from, uh, from those he encountered on the other side and, and didn't partake of them himself, although the, the meeting house where he led worship in Hudson, Wisconsin is now a bar. <laughs> the, uh, in any event, the, the, what, what you need to know, so, so Two lessons here, or, or two important things to, to uh, note in this story. The first is that, that the minister was ahead of the congregation in the 1880s when it came to being welcoming to Norwegians. So I just want to kind of say that out loud. The, the minister was leading the congregation along with him. The second thing you need to know about that dancing music is that it was Mozart. Oh. <laughs> Today, if a congregation played nothing but Mozart, we would consider them stuck in a former paradigm rather than being on the dangerous cutting edge of musical licentiousness. Well, Gannett left and he was followed by, uh, uh, I love a lot of the ministers of, of our history. Uh, some, of, some of the ministers I relate, ministerial colleagues I relate most easily to are, are Dead, <laughs> and so uh, so I really admire them, and my heart belongs to another age. Uh, so uh, so I, I loved Gannett, and I loved his successor, who was Samuel McCord Crothers, former Presbyterian minister who had had a change of heart. So he was ordained as a Presbyterian minister, served the Presbyterians out to Santa Barbara, uh, and in Santa Barbara became. Uh, convinced that that Unitarianism and St. Paul uh, were in his future, uh, which to me is a noteworthy sacrifice uh, on both counts, actually. I mean, the, the integrity of becoming a, a Unitarian is magnificent, and we can celebrate that. But the fact of, of the matter is, is that he could have been a much more famous Presbyterian minister if he had remained there. But he had a change of heart theologically, was willing to come here to St. Paul, I think, uh, somehow imagining that it would be a temporary assignment while he proved his credentials uh, with, with the Unitarians on, on his way to something, uh, someplace with better weather, which for him, unfortunately, only turned out to be Boston. But um, uh, Crothers was, was a, a remarkable figure, a, a rather gentle, uh, sensitive individual by all accounts, and arguably, uh, ultimately, one of the most significant, if not the most significant, Unitarian ministers of his generation. I'm actually going to go so far as to make a comparison between your current co-ministers and and uh, Samuel Crothers. That I'm, I'm often, you know, looking for linkages. How do do current incumbents reflect? the history of ministerial selections that have been made in the past. And the particular comparison that I would make is that after he proved himself here in St. Paul, he went on to first parish in Cambridge uh, as, as the minister, a very prominent eastern pulpit right across the street from some school. <laughs> and, and Crothers became the most significant mentor of new ministers of his generation. So that, that he may not have had quite the same public profile uh, as, as some other Unitarian ministers of his day, although he was a regular contributor to the Atlantic Monthly, uh, and there are parts of my soul that I would sell for that writing assignment. Uh, so, so, you know, he, he had some significant ways to express himself publicly, but most significantly he became a mentor of emerging new ministers in our association. And one could argue that, that if, if you were a minister who came of age during the, the first three decades of the 20th century, some, at some point or other, 
Samuel Crothers had his mentoring clause in you uh, and helped to shape you as a minister. And so he literally shaped an entire generation of Unitarian ministers through mentorship. And I actually see a very direct and significant linkage between that ministry and the ministry that now exists in this congregation and the impact that those two ministries have for the generation that follows them. That's one could say arguably one of your characteristics as, as a congregation, a mentoring teaching congregation uh, for, for the larger ministry of Unitarian Universalism. Well, Crothers came here and, and, uh, uh, and in some ways, you know, curiously enough, he was more distinctly Unitarian uh, compared to, to Gannett and had a more easy relationship with the Eastern establishment which proved to be critical for the next major outreach project of this congregation because it involved money. And it involved Crothers' ability to utilize his confidence with the American Unitarian Association to get them to free money up, which was not an easy task in those days or, well, one could say even now. But, but it was during uh, Crothers' watch that the mission to Western Canada began. And so one of, the, one of the pieces of your history is that this church really is the mother church, uh, not just of a handful of isolated congregations uh, within the general vicinity of St. Paul. It is the mother church of every Unitarian congregation that exists today on the three Canadian prairie provinces and in northern Ontario. That it began as an outreach initiative here. And it began through the work of Crothers and since Crothers, like his predecessor, didn't have a bought and paid for uh, personal secretary from the American Unitarian Association, it happened with a lay member of this congregation, one of the charter members of this congregation, who used Unity Church as the home base to operate the post office mission of the Minnesota Unitarian Conference. You were also the founders of the Minnesota Unitarian Conference for what it's worth, that you, you it, this was the congregation that first convened uh, the other congregations in the state to come together to form a conference. Jenny McCain, who later became Jenny McCain Peterson, I'll allude to that story later. Jenny McCain had come here to live with her brothers uh, who were in the lumber business. Another piece of your history is, is that Unity Church was built in the early years partly on cutting down trees. Uh, and so it's also no accident, I suppose, that that first building of yours would be a lovely wooden structure uh, and not something built out of stone and brick, since wood was readily available uh, from the companies of several members of this congregation. In any event, uh, Jenny McCain Peterson came with her brothers, became a charter member of the congregation, was, in the language of the day, a spinster, uh, and devoted herself to church work. And by and large, served as the volunteer office secretary of this congregation, as distinct from the board secretary, and, and also ran this post office mission. The post office mission was a project that had begun in Cincinnati, Ohio, some years before. And it attempted to use the absolute latest technology available, the most cutting edge technology, the United States Postal Service, in order to deliver Unitarian tracts and missives to people in isolated places. Uh, it's really the forerunner of what today is the Church of the Larger Fellowship. And the second most vibrant office of the post office mission, there were three primary ones, Cincinnati, Chicago, and St. Paul. The second most vibrant office after Cincinnati was the office sponsored by Unity Church here in St. Paul. And Jenny McCain uh, sent out hundreds, indeed thousands, of tracts every year, responded to incoming correspondence, developed a corresponding relationship with hundreds of people uh, across the, the Midwest, particularly here in the state of Minnesota, but also in the Dakotas, in Montana, uh, back east in Wisconsin, uh, the, the, uh, uh, several places. And she entered, in, entered into this wonderful corresponding relationship. And one of the people she heard from was 
a uh, theological school dropout from Iceland named Björn Peterson. Björn Peterson at the time was about 60 years old. He had come to North America after his, his uh, farm in Iceland was pretty much destroyed by volcanic ash and had sought to reestablish himself. He had been thrown out of, of the theological school in Reykjavik for leading a student rebellion uh, when, when he was a young man and went into farming rather than the ministry. The two vocations being somewhat related, if you think it through to the ultimate end. But um, over here, he got the religion bug again. And he entered into correspondence with Jenny McCain. She learned of his theological training and secured, with Samuel Crothers' help, a $500 a year grant from the American Unitarian Association to pay Bjorn Peterson to be a missionary among his countrymen, who were mostly in Western Canada, but there were a handful in Minnesota and, and in uh, uh, North Dakota. And so that, that mission, the mission among the Icelandic community and the mission to Western Canada was coordinated out of this church for the duration of the 1880s, until finally in 1890, Bjorn and Jenny met one another in person. And there were sparks. 60-year-old Bjorn, 53-year-old Jenny. And they entered into an, an arrangement, an agreement, that they would marry. They would go to Winnipeg and marry. But instead of going around the countryside as an itinerant Unitarian preacher, Bjorn had to settle down and organize a damn church. And so that was the deal. It was, it was the strangest prenuptial agreement that you will ever encounter anywhere. And they kept the agreement. They were married in Winnipeg in 1890 by the Lutheran minister that Bjorn sought to displace uh, in, in the community. And they set about to organize a congregation. Interestingly enough, when the, the congregation that was organized built its first building, it was called Unity Hall, uh, a name that was uh, familiar and meaningful uh, to, to Jenny. And frankly, the largest ethnic outreach that was ever undertaken in the history of American Unitarianism or Universalism began with the creation of that mission outpost sponsored by this congregation. Within months, a Lutheran minister north of Winnipeg preached uh, the Universalist heresy uh, to his congregation and resigned from the Lutheran Synod. Quickly, Jenny McCain and Samuel Crothers went to work to secure uh, this minister, Magnus Skaftason, for the Unitarian cause, to keep those Universalists out of the province of Manitoba. And so they were enfolded into the mix. And through it all, Jenny continued to correspond back and forth with the women that she had known in Unity Church. And when it became apparent that Magnus Skaptison was having trouble serving the seven congregations he served, separated by 60 miles, the women of Unity Church launched into action and did what was, uh, secured what was obviously needed. A horse, a sled, and a buggy. And so, so the, the members of this congregation contributed to the growth of Unitarianism in Western Canada, uh, again, by employing the most readily available cutting-edge technologies in order to advance the faith in an unlikely place. Crothers continued here for a time left in 1894 to head on to his great ministry in Cambridge, but that sense of being connected and responsible for a territory that was larger than the city of St. Paul continued to exist in, in the life of this congregation. Uh, it continued through, through the subsequent ministers and found a, re, a new focus with, with uh, Frederick May Elliott, who came here in 1917, stayed for 20 years, having had to be persuaded to come to St. Paul. I, I, it breaks my heart to tell you this news, but... <laughs> Frederick May Elliott did not consider in 1917 that the suggestion that he go to St. Paul was actually something that was necessarily going to further his career. At the time, he was the assistant minister at the first parish in Cambridge as the associate of 
Dr. Samuel McCord Crothers. And it was Dr. Crothers who persuaded Frederick May Elliott to come here uh, hesitatingly, you know, with kind of concern for how this was going to play for his career. Frederick May Elliott didn't want to be sent out to the frontier and discover that his, his career at the heart of Unitarianism was forever over. So he came reluctantly, partly as a favor uh, to, to his beloved senior minister, expecting to spend a couple or three years here and then go back to New England where he could have a prosperous career in the very neighborhood where the name Elliot would secure you a pulpit. Instead, he spent 20 years here and he left even more reluctantly than he came. In fact, uh, some of the current Some of the reputed craziness of the Unitarian Universalist Association in recent decades can be attributed to Frederick May Elliott's reluctance to leave St. Paul in 1937. Because, of course, he was involved in the famous Commission on Appraisal, the real one, the one that didn't, wasn't a standing committee but was a response to crisis. He'd been here for nearly 20 years at that time. The American Unitarian Association was in serious trouble. It was the first of two occasions when the association was frankly in peril of going out of business. And, and so at that point in time, after nearly 20 years here, he had developed a reputation for, among other things, being a sophisticated modern manager. And the thought that he could bring the modern management movement to bear on the larger association and to retool it for a new age was very appealing. And so he, and someone later known as a great theologian among us, James Luther Adams, were really the two key figures in the emergence of the Commission on Appraisal in the mid-1930s, which looked at Unitarianism from top to bottom and provided a prescription for what we needed uh, to do to actually remain relevant as a denominational body moving forward. It saved the American Unitarian Association. It also introduced, though, a peculiarity into our organizational structure because the Commission on Appraisal created the Office of Moderator, a new position at the time. Uh, and the imagination that Frederick May Elliott had was that he was going to be the moderator of the American Unitarian Association, joyfully remain in St. Paul as the minister of this congregation until the end of his days. That was the plan. And serve the larger movement from this new office of moderator, showing up to, to guide the important meetings, to keep the process on track, to make the governance pure and good and whole. Is this a theme that seems familiar <laughs> in your recent history? That he was going to do this and contribute to the association that way. And then in 1937, the board of directors of the American Unitarian Association effectively did a bait and switch. They said, Frederick, we actually need you as the president of the association, not as the moderator. And we've basically spent every decade since 1937 trying to dismantle a particular configuration of the office of moderator that was created almost specifically so that Frederick May Elliott could serve it. And so we have some certain systemic peculiarities as an association that, that well, I guess we can blame Unity Church for uh, because of the quality of the leadership that it provided to the larger movement. In any event, I mean, Frederick May Elliott's uh, ministry here was was a period of uncharacteristic growth. Uh, he was, I think, of, of the great ministers since Theodore Parker. He was the Unitarian uh, minister who was most committed to the welfare, well-being, and spiritual development of youth and young adults. I mean, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that, that, um, that he was uncommonly devoted to the youth and young adults of this congregation when compared with any other minister of his generation. And that, too, ended up affecting the American Unitarian Association. Because when Frederick May Elliott went to the American Unitarian Association as its president 
directly from this church. He took the ideology of the Tower Club, the genius of the Tower Club, and he moved it to 25 Beacon Street and created the most robust religious education and, and youth and young adult ministry programs that this association has ever known. It was a period of glory that included his, his retaining of Sophia Lyon Fawes as a curriculum developer, but actually involved an exponential expansion of, of the children's and, and youth and young adults programming of the association at a critical time. And I think that that's one of the, one of the clearest factors in the explosion of membership that began for Unitarianism <coughs> during Frederick May Elliott's presidency and that continued into the 1960s. No Frederick May Elliott, no experience here at Unity Church, no time on the Western Front during the First World War which forever conditioned his sense of where the church's ministry lay. If those things hadn't happened, the prosperity of Unitarianism and later Unitarian Universalism in, in the, the third quarter of the 20th century simply wouldn't have happened. So again, you know, your good actions have consequences as a congregation. And the decisions that our individual congregations make about leadership, about ministry emphasis, about the programs that, that they are willing to commit their resources to, the imagination they have about who they might yet serve, who is not yet being served, that has ramifications not just locally, but it has ramifications across the region and across the country. Elliot, of course, was, was uh, succeeded uh, uh, by Wallace Robbins, who became another one of the great educator ministers uh, in, in the history of, of this congregation. And as we get closer uh, to, to the modern period, I'll let you tell your own story uh, yourselves. But I will encourage you to think of your most recent ministries and of your most recent activities as a, a congregation uh, within the context of the stage that was set by these earlier ministries, by the commitments that this congregation made, by the risks it took, by the fears it encountered. Financial fear has been a part of your history since the 1880s. And, and it, it rises up to the surface from time to time when you become just a little anxious about whether you can take that next step or not. And, and so, you know, you, you built a bell tower, but you couldn't afford the bell. So you didn't put the bell in for like decades. Uh, you, you, uh, you built the space for a chapel, but you didn't have the money to actually build the chapel within it when you created the space. So you deferred that actually for a shorter period of time. You closed that gap earlier. At several points in, in your history, you become financially anxious. And to the extent that that's a measure of caution and appropriate prudence, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But curiously enough, you've also always come through those periods. Uh, and I think that's related to that genius that, that lies on the other side of it. The sense of actually having a clear mission uh, about serving people, uh, not just people who are already here, but people who could be here and haven't found this place yet. Your commitment to being connected with other places. Until the 1950s, uh, this church was the gathering place when ministers gathered across the entire upper Midwest. It was the host. Before we had very sophisticated regional organizations, uh, Unity Church at St. Paul inserted itself as the self-initiating host for larger things. These are all pieces of the DNA of the history of this uh, congregation and all things for which, for the most part, you should be proud and legacies that you should uh, be inclined to, to richly seize again and again and again in being bold, in being future looking, in being one of the most significant, refreshing, life-giving, inspiring <coughs> expressions of liberal religion on the continent. And I think I'm going to stop, stop right oh. there.
so much, Stephen. It was just, just uh, inspiring. And, and uh, the way in which you uh, tell the story foreshadowing our hopes and our efforts now is uh, deeply moving to me. And I know we all wanted to hear about Arthur. <laughs> I certainly did. I would defer to another 15, 20 minutes if you want to talk about Arthur. Yeah. Um, suffice to say, however, that as compelling as this story is, it is a very narrow telling in that the story of the ministers and the closest associates of the ministers is just one version of the story of any congregation or of any movement. The, uh, the true story is your story. And the, the detailed compassion and the range of commitments uh, that the laity of the congregation live into and express in the world. Um, when we came together as uh, the new uh, denominational relations team, we set aside the affairs uh, and, and chose relations uh, for relatively obvious reasons. Um, I at first thought that the group of people who had gathered in the room were there primarily to talk about how we could support the UUA uh, and the UUSC and how we could kind of uh, restore the traditional commitments to the larger association. Uh, a perfectly worthy activity. But then one of Arthur was actually very good at that. Yes, he was. <laughs> he was. We'll get to Arthur in a minute. Okay. <laughs> Indulge me. Um, and then one among us, um, I will embarrass her by calling her out, Joan Macklin, who is here this morning, um, said, look, somewhere in Kansas, there are six people meeting in a living room who would like to build a church. Uh, that church could become a church like Unity. It, become, it could become a place that really changes people's lives and enriches the life of the community, but they won't be able to do it alone. If the Unitarian Universalist Association is our best instrument for supporting that little group in the living room in Kansas, then we should get behind the Unitarian Universalist Association. And eventually we should grow strong enough to do that work ourselves. And when we went from, uh, when we looked from that perspective, the next obvious step seemed to be inviting Stefan to tell us our own story and to try to rekindle that sense of evangelical fervor, that's what it is, friends. We may be uncomfortable with that notion, but that's where we come from. And I think that's where we're going. And it's interesting uh, that you chose to talk about the Norwegians and the Icelanders and left it up to us um, to name the groups who uh, have yet to hear our gospel and whose presence among us uh, could well enrich our lives beyond measure. Uh, the naming of those groups and the framing of that effort is frankly underway uh, and many of you are already involved in it. Questions, comments, what would you like to talk about or should we really let Stefan talk some more and talk about Arthur? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Stefan, come on back. I know you're ready soon. <laughs> the, uh, I, I have to say, I actually just discovered something about Arthur. Uh, I, I run this uh, little thing called the Liberal Lectionary, which posts daily readings uh, from the liberal religious tradition. Uh, and uh, among, uh, among the people I wanted to post readings from were actually uh, Arthur himself and Arthur's father. I discovered uh, by, by interacting with the United States Copyright Office that a day before the copyrights on his father's works were due to expire, Arthur renewed them all. Uh, in order to secure a copyright for his heirs and successors to, to the maximum limit possible. And the interesting thing about that is that that's actually very reflective about, um, about the, the, uh, uh, the level of care and attention to detail that, that uh, Arthur Foote provided, while at the same time 
managing to convey an impression that was kind of much more relaxed and easygoing than we normally associate with someone who pays that much attention uh, to detail like, you know, copyrights and contracts and, and, uh, and agreements. Uh, so it was kind of a, a, a fascinating insight for me into someone who, as it turns out, was, I think, the first um, Unitarian minister I ever heard outside of, of Winnipeg. Uh, so he stands out vividly in my memory. He was like, it, you know, in the eyes of, a, of someone who was, was who had an age in the single digits at the time, Arthur stands out in my mind as being like six foot twelve tall, <laughs> and uh, uh, and just a a, uh, a very commanding presence who by that time was actually already looking like a New England sea captain, uh, presumably on on his way to preparing for uh, for uh, uh, retirement and and pottery making. He is he is a significant figure in that that he probably comes the closest to, to having uh, a balanced relationship between the inner and the outer. Uh, to the extent that this congregation's history has tended to move back and forth from, from an inward focus, from that oasis, uh, to a distinctly outward focus, uh, looking you know, at, at, at the opportunities in, in the community for Unitarian Universalist growth, Arthur may have come closest to being at the sweet spot between those, those two approaches, although he did sort of usher in what became under his successor an oasis uh, period in, in the life of, of the congregation. Uh, but I think that my impression of him, and certainly his writing, who hasn't read his book, uh, Taking Down the Defenses, yeah. You all have it in your library, don't you? Yes, yes. And, we have multiple copies. Multiple, yeah. Multiple. I, uh, yeah, well, it's all copyright. <laughs> and you can't post it to the liberal lectionary without uh, permission from the owner of the copyright uh, because of his level of care. But the, the uh, um, that's, it, it actually proved to be one of the most popular meditation manuals, which is what it originally was one of the most popular meditation manuals in the history of, of the American Unitarian Association and subsequently Unitarian Universalist Association's uh, publications of those volumes. It ranks somewhere in the, the top ten uh, in terms of its uh, popularity and longevity uh, over the years. The essays are, are in, given the, that they're not long, uh, they, they are... Um, uh, deep and complex uh, in relation to, to much of what uh, gets published, which again seems to me to be uh, a, a reflection of Arthur Foote's character, deep and complex. Uh, a, a, a tremendous ability to, to, uh, uh, to, to, um, to kind of cut, to, to look at very complicated matters cut through them as quickly and cleanly as possible uh, and arrive at significant conclusions about them. So his influence in the larger movement was, was in part a reflection of that book. He likewise maintained a certain number of, of uh, mentoring relationships with younger ministerial colleagues, although fewer uh, than either Samuel Crothers or, or your current uh, ministers. He, in that sense, was for I think for younger colleagues a bit more distant figure uh, in in terms of, of providing counsel. But but those who got to know him, uh, you know, really came to admire him and appreciate him. He brought in, you know, the, Walter Robbins' ministry. His immediate successor was the shortest of your settled ministries over I think pretty much the whole 20th century. I think you would have to go back to the first decade of the 20th century for a ministry that was that short. Uh, Wally came here very young uh, as, as a minister and left rather young, which came I think... Came out against the war in 1943. Came out against the war? the pulpit. Yeah. Lasted a month. Yeah. <laughs> and landed quite successfully. Yes. Uh, <laughs> In, uh, as the president of Meadville Theological School. Uh, so it was billed as a promotion. 
Um, although, I don't think it felt like a promotion as the transition was happening. Um, but but the, and the, the interesting thing is that actually Arthur's position was not significantly different from Wallace Robbins. Uh, but he came in uh, with that position and, and, and was uh, more nuanced. Uh, about, about speaking uh, his truth. So the first part of his ministry was a period of healing uh, in, in the life of the congregation, which he was extraordinarily well-suited temperamentally, I think, to, to engage in. And his influence in, in the larger movement was quieter but significant. Uh, so he had, the, he had the ready ear of, of his predecessor, Frederick Elliott, uh, in, in the office of, of the uh, uh, American Unitarian Association presidency, um, but, was, um, but was not as visible in the larger movement as, as frankly, I, either his immediate predecessors or his current successors uh, have, have been in the movement, but was still this very quiet, steady uh, presence. How, how many of you were here during his ministry? So there's still a handful of folks here. How many of you were, is there anyone in the room right now who was here when Frederick Elliott was still president? No? Bruce Stryker Gordon is our only member. Is the only member left from that? Um, Wally Robbins? So this is now a, an Arthur Foote and, and later congregation by and large. I mean, the, 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 uh, the folks who were here uh, during uh, Arthur's uh, ministry can probably speak more uh, compellingly about him than, than I can. My impressions are a child's impressions. You know, I mean, I'm talking about hearing him preach when I was nine or ten years old. Uh, and, and so it really is this, this uh, gigantic Im impression I have and then some sporadic contacts uh, in, in adulthood and, of course, reading his magnificent uh, writings. But it was a, a profound stabilizing period. One of the things that we see in congregations is that uh, they, they have periods of growth, they have periods of decline, and they have periods that we used to call plateaus. And, um, and in some ways, I think Arthur's ministry would have previously been described as a plateau, and that would have, would have actually given it short shrift. It would have been an unfair characterization, although that's the language uh, that, that we tended to use. There was numerical growth in that period, which pretty much reflected the numerical growth of, of Unitarianism and later Unitarian Universalism. But it wasn't you know, exponentially greater than what we would have expected based on the larger movement. Um, but it, the, the, in, in recent years, uh, some people who study congregations have started talking Instead of talking about plateaus, which tends to have a pejorative term, you know, you've been storming up the hill and then you kind of goof off on a plateau. Isn't that the image that, that comes to mind? Increasingly, uh, a growing number of consultants are describing these as periods of consolidation. It's a plateau if you later descend from it. Okay? But if you actually later grow from it, then plateau doesn't quite capture it. And so there's a sense in which Arthur Foote's ministry, even though numerical growth kind of continued apace during that period, it was a period of consolidation in the life of, of the congregation, where some recent shocks were, were you know, neutralized and transcended, where uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the foundation of the congregation was re-explored uh, revisited. If Frederick May Elliott brought you modern management <coughs> and attention to youth and young adults, Arthur Foote brought you theological depth as, as a congregation. That, that, in a sense, his single most significant characteristic as, as a minister is that he is, I, I think it's fair to say that, that, that spiritually he is one of the most profoundly deep ministers of the 20th century in our movement, and I would expect that that's how you would have experienced him, those of you who remember him, 
And actually, if you didn't experience him that way at the time, you need to go back and reread uh, his, his record here, because that's what, what you would discover. In that, I would actually compare Arthur Foote in your history most closely to William Channing Gannon. That in some ways they, they can appear to be coming from a different direction. Uh, in, in that, you know, Gannett was the, the young minister with grave doubts uh, who, who uh, uh, from a, a pres prestigious um, uh, Unitarian pedigree, but a young minister with, with grave doubts who came here and, and managed to turn the theological emphasis of the congregation uh, just enough to put it on the cutting edge. It strikes me that Arthur is someone who arrived with less doubt than William Channing Gannett, about as august a Unitarian pedigree uh, as, as uh, Gannett uh, came with, and arrived at a point in time where Unitarian Universalism was, have I told you yet that I'm a humanist? <coughs> I, I, I need to say this to protect myself before I say what I'm about to say. So I, I am a self-described, self-identified humanist within Unitarian Universalism. And that has not been without consequences. I would argue that, that Arthur uh, Foote arrived here precisely at a period when Unitarianism, because it was still a Unitarian church when he arrived, Unitarian, Unitarianism was embarked on a pathway to theological shallowness. And in the same way that, that the Unitarianism that, Channing, that William Channing Gannett was seeking to deal with was a Unitarianism that had become stuck in a previous generation and his theological depth helped to shift this congregation and ultimately the movement uh, a, away from that stuckness of an earlier generation. Arthur Foote arrived at a time when we were substituting, I think, shallowness for spiritual depth in an effort to be popular. So, so that there was a, a sense in which that era is characterized by Unitarianism becoming experts at telling people what it's not. It was a period when Unitarian Universalism became very sophisticated at revealing to people the things it didn't believe in. And a lot of energy and investment was, was placed into showing how just as 7-Up as was the uncola, now that's a later generation, but just as 7-Up was the uncola, Unitarianism was the unchurch. I mean, that, that was a dominant emphasis that really took hold in the 1940s and flourished through much of, of, of Arthur Foote's ministry at Unity Church. He flipped it. And I think that he came here and his influence in this congregation, but more significantly in the larger movement, was actually to invite conversations about spiritual depth about helping Unitarians to understand how you express, and, and for, for those who use Unitarian Universalists, forgive me, but with, with the first part of Arthur's ministry, with most of Arthur's ministry here, we're in the Unitarian phase. He actually invited you and the larger movement to articulate what it was that you were for, what it was that you actually believed. Now, it was always sort of with a twist. You know, if you read Arthur Foote's writings, uh, he's, he's leading you down, oftentimes, an apparent path of conventionality, and then all of a sudden there's a twist at the end, and, and you end up kind of walking out a side door into a space you weren't expecting to be. And he does precisely the same thing with those passages where, where you think he's leading you into blissful rebellion, which would have been kind of more in keeping with the temperament of, of many Unitarians of the era, and that you're just, you're just about to give the boot to the church universal. And he leads you through a different door, again with a twist, into a different space. So I would actually describe Arthur's ministry here and in the larger movement 
as an antidote to the excesses of Unitarianism at the time. And so that, that he was calling this place and the larger movement back to a place of spiritual health, pointing out that, that you know, you can only kind of get so far telling the world what you don't believe, telling the world the doctrines you, you refute without being actually able to offer, well, good news. <laughs> Arthur Foote was, for his generation, one of the great good news Unitarian preachers. That, that he had, seemed to have a certain impatience with, um, with that approach to religion that kind of got a few laughs or that allowed people to puncture the, the stereotypes we created about others uh, without actually offering something of depth and substance in return. And that's a piece of your DNA. It has led some people across the river from you to mistakenly peg this congregation as being more conservative than it actually was. It was, you know, um, depth is not always a conservative phenomenon. Some of us would argue it rarely is. <laughs> that, 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 that depth involves a quality of being in the world that is, that is fully aware, fully appreciative, appropriately critical, and ultimately wise. And I think those characteristics were at the heart of the gospel that Arthur Foote preached in this congregation. And, and that, that allowed people to see you as being a little more conventional than you were, because Arthur Foote proclaimed that not every convention needed to be dispensed with, and that not every innovation was good for the soul. And at the same time, he was in many ways one of the most undogmatic, uh, openly heretical, uh, sincerely open to new inspiration and, and new innovation preachers that we've ever had. And there is a very clear sense uh, in which he was a living embodiment of, of that line in, in one of our hymns that revelation is not sealed. Period. So that's my gestalt impression of Arthur Foote. I would venture to say that we could offer complimentary copies of taking down the defenses to people who are here. We have plenty. We have. We're down to five thousand. We have plenty of copies of Arthur Woods taking down the defenses. It, and it's, it's if anybody would like a remarkable, uh, it is. If anybody wants a complimentary copy as you leave, it's required. I, it's required reading. Um, I, I mean. My, my liberal lectionary, my, my little online project that I launched is, uh, I, I know it's successful because I get hate mail about it. <laughs> um, and I get hate mail from people who want uh, Unitarian Universalism to be like a laser beam that, that looks that way or looks that way, but, but doesn't have any genuine breadth or depth. And I launched it precisely uh, so that, that, uh, that the more distinctly Christian Unitarians could be offended by some of the prophetic pronouncements of humanist uh, uh, speakers, so that our more humanistic folks would be forced to confront the fact of our roots uh, in the liberal Christian tradition, so that theists would be challenged by non-theists and vice versa. I, I wanted to share the whole broad tradition uh, with, with people so that we can have a refined understanding of where we come from, who we are, what we really include, and what opportunities that that presents us. And, and my kind of foundational ideology beneath that uh, is related to two things. I think that we teach the history of our movement first locally, and then we expand into a wider and wider consciousness. You know, so when I deal with young people around Unitarian Universalist history, I think it's more important to talk about the history of the congregation that they and their parents are a part of, rather than talk about what William Ellery Channing did in 1819, as important as, as I think that is. And similarly, 
every one of our significant congregations has its own rich literary history. Imagine fashioning your own congregational Bible. If, if the only thing you got from the Unitarian Universalist tradition here at Unity Church was a collection of writings that included William Channing Gannett and Samuel McCord Crothers and, and Frederick May Elliott and Arthur Foote and Gretchen Thompson and, and the whole procession of people and the poetry of Jenny McCain Peterson, <laughs> I would throw in. Uh, if, if that was the only Bible you had to operate with, you would have everything you need in the world to live rich, deep, meaningful lives spiritually. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'd like to mention about uh, Arthur, <coughs> and there are people here that were around for a long time, is one of the events that I think generates the uh, concept of Arthur as being very uh, creative and, and uh, kind of uh, inspiring. <coughs> right in there, he had a very serious uh, sermon that he gave one Sunday. This would have been in probably the late, uh, early 70s, mid 70s, somewhere in there. I don't even remember what the service was. 60s. But as we came in to the doors in all of the places, we came into a, a chapel filled with mattresses all over everything, <laughs> all the way back, all the way under mattresses. And as you came in, you were first given the program, and then you crawled up on a mattress, and it was explained, find your, your place that's comfortable, because that's where you're going to stay for this service. And I don't know, but the, the people who were around, I can, uh, that, that memory is so fixed in my mind, I can never... We found one other person who remembers that so yes, yes. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I am so obsessive compulsive that I couldn't have possibly found a comfortable place <laughs> that Sunday morning. I would have been uncomfortable for the whole service. From my standpoint, another thing I think that's important to recognize with Arthur is that he was a stutterer. Mm -hmm. And he had, he, every stutterer has a constant, continuous, lifelong effort to control it. And unless somebody told you that, which is what happened in my case, was I was working with people at the Skullics at the time, you wouldn't know it. Uh, but he overcome and maybe included his strength because of his stutter. He's quite a, quite a dude. <laughs> so what was the significance of the mattress? What was the purpose of it? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we were so overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the obvious significance is that he obviously had connections in the bedding industry. <laughs> I just remember his vocabulary being so good that if he did start to stutter on an S, he just quickly had another word. It just was that quick. He also, I mean, he was part of a... Um, a, a subgroup of, of our ministers who focused very seriously on liturgy and the arts in, in combination. And, um, I mean, von Ogden Volk stands out in that regard, but it's a handful of our ministers who really appreciated liturgics as an art form and actually then understood the very delicate and significant interplay between art and liturgy. And to come full circle from where we began, <laughs> Arthur Foote used to preach here in the morning and then travel out to White Bear to gather that community and conduct services there. So in the beginning years of the White Bear congregation's life, Arthur was their minister and he actually went to families who lived out in that area who were members here at Unity and invited them to help join with him in founding that congregation. And in that sense, it really was a satellite it was. In, in the early years. Did we buy him a horse and sleigh? Don't even think about it. <laughs> <laughs> a horse and sleigh? And sleigh. <laughs> well, fortunately, they have a very, they have a, a permeable parking lot. <laughs> so that if the horse left any all right, behind, all right. it was just a good thing to Well, Stefan, uh, I can, I'm sure you can sense how wrapped we have been. Uh, in your uh, 
approach and, Actually, there and were your reverence for this place. Are you, do you want to interrupt me? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, there were a few people who could have used one of Arthur's mattresses. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. Uh, I would like the uh, members of the team of the uh, denominational relations team that are here to just kind of wave your hands. There's some of you here. Okay, so, so there are one, two, three. Uh, feel free, if you're interested in getting more involved in this work, to uh, talk with them. Uh, the history is, is both important and entertaining, and it's the beginning of uh, uh, strengthening um, our commitments beyond these walls, um, of learning once again to walk together with the larger movement. Um, I want to introduce Nancy Hagee, who is a member of our regional staff, and a, so also a member of our church. And a former member of the staff, who was our religious education director for many years. Um, and uh, if you wish to learn more about uh, regional activities, and in particular the uh, uh, regional, the Mid-America Mid Regional Conference, which is coming up in April, um, please feel free to talk to Nancy. Uh, there's also um, uh, a person responsible for sharing that information named Valerie Tremelot, who wasn't able to be here today. Um, there's room on the team. There's uh, a variety of opportunities in the larger movement to connect all the way from the Mid-America events to General Assembly, which will be held uh, in June in Providence this year. Um, and we hope that you will choose to get more, uh, more involved in those opportunities. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Is there anything else? Well, I'm wondering if there are any questions. There are 27 years of Roy's ministry, um, I'm many of, which was a very rich and complicated time, and in many ways a very positive time for Unity Church, but a difficult story to tell, and a somewhat controversial one in some way. I'm just wondering if people have questions. Are there, there more questions? Oh, look, there are. Good. <laughs> Great. Uh, what do you know about the, uh, any possible interactions between uh, Universalists over in that other city and, and the Unitarians here prior to merger? Well, let me start by sharing your Universalist secret <laughs> as a congregation. Um, there, there's actually more than one. In the, um, in the 19th century, uh, a, a portion of your membership was made up with, uh, of Universalists here in St. Paul who preferred, preferred you to the universalist option that did exist in the city at the time. So um, that's not the same as a connection. But your, your universalist secret is that Elizabeth Elliot was born and raised as a universalist. Now, tell us our Quaker secret too. <laughs> Well, I have to tell you, the, the interest... Who was Elizabeth Elliot? Yeah. Elizabeth Elliot was Mrs. Elliot. Uh, Mrs. Frederick May Elliot. Elizabeth Buckley Lee. Uh, she, she was. Uh, before she married a young theological student in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And she grew up in a Universalist family. She was from originally from somewhere further west. And they, yeah, which yeah, even a bigger scandal. And they, they moved to New England, and, and she met uh, uh, Frederick May Elliott uh, in Cambridge. The, the interesting thing about that is that um, Frederick May Elliott, uh, we've had various periods where we had kind of relationships that didn't go very far uh, with, with we. We are we. I mean, we are Unitarians and Universalists. I, I need to dislodge myself. Uh, from the pre-1961 era. Uh, the <laughs> well, nothing good has happened since 1953. The, uh, the, uh, um, Frederick May Elliott was both the most pragmatically disposed and friendly disposed of Unitarian leaders towards the Universalists. So, of course, without Frederick May Elliott, uh, engaging in, in untoward relations with the Universalists by, among other things, giving them free office space in Boston. 
so the American Unitarian Association, under Frederick Elliott's leadership, gave a headquarters, but they didn't give the building, they gave free rent, to the Universalist Church for its headquarters uh, in Boston. Frederick Elliott was, was uh, just very well disposed towards the Universalists and did more than any other president to set the stage for murder. Other presidents had tried and failed. Uh, Louis Cornish, his immediate uh, predecessor, uh, had, had created a, a free church conference that went nowhere, uh, ultimately. So, so there had been, been efforts at a national level, but Frederick Elliott, who it turns out was married to a universalist who then, you know, did the proper thing and joined his church, uh, uh, he had this warm disposition, and, and there's, to me, an obvious connection there. There were uh, connections over the years but between uh, Unitarians here and in Minneapolis and the Universalist Church, but they were pretty thin. Um, the the uh, um, and that was a characteristic pattern across the country. For for instance, you know, William Ellery Channing and Hosea Ballou, the leaders of the Unitarian and Universalist movements, uh, respectively, lived blocks apart from one another in Boston served congregations that were within a mile of one another. And there is absolutely no evidence in the diaries of either man that they ever even met. <laughs> now, bear in mind that when they were there, Boston was a city of about 50,000 people. Uh, but there's no evidence that they ever met. There were better relationships here. Uh, and in particular, during the period when Marion shut her, was, was minister of the Universalist Church in, in Minneapolis. There was more interaction between Shudder and the ministers of, of, uh, of the Unitarian churches than there were in the periods before or after. Uh, but by and large, particularly when, when James Tuttle was minister in, in uh, uh, Minneapolis, he didn't even get along particularly well with other Universalist ministers. Uh, let alone interact with, with the Unitarian ones. There, there was some cooperation around social service projects uh, through the years between the Universalists and the Unitarians. Uh, from about the 1930s onward, uh, the, the Universalist ministers were invited uh, to Unitarian minister gatherings, which were mostly hosted uh, by the St. Paul congregation but it was pretty sporadic. Uh, business people probably had more to do with one another. So, you know, prominent business uh, persons in the Unitarian and Universalist congregations uh, interacted with one another in different venues. Uh, so Unitarians and Universalists were more likely to meet at the Rotary Club than, than, than around the communion table. No, we have supplied them with all four of their ministers now, so that perhaps religions are improving. <laughs> well, I, you know, then you have you have the arrival. You know, as as merger was approaching, the relationships became very close. So the 1950s, there was a wholesale, wholesale change, but in the earlier years, uh, the contacts were pretty minimal, um, and not a lot of people assume that uh, that has to do with social class uh, and education. There's actually a lot less evidence for that than, than the content of modern preaching would suggest. It was other factors. Do you want to recognize people yourself or do you want to... You can recognize them, sure. That's easier. Yep. Um, in explaining the Arthur Foote copyright thing, you mentioned a personal project of yours. Oh, yeah. Is that an academic thing or is it public? It's just, it's, it's the Liberal Lectionary. It's on Facebook and, and a blog site, yeah. It, it's an effort to give liberal religious readings to the world, uh, which are copyright free. So you know, Arthur got in my way here. And but we can read it. If I if I had known what he was up to, I mean, literally, he renewed the copyrights the day before uh, they needed to be renewed in order to get the maximum copyright protection. If I'd have if I'd have had the presence of mind to think of how the world would evolve and that there would be an internet. Uh, I'd have just asked them for permission. In, in so you need a direct descendant. I need a direct. Well, I, yeah, I need grandsons and member. Okay. Well, because because his stuff is great. His father's stuff is great. 
uh, you know, he comes from a prestigious Unitarian family that has been, you know, writing for 200 years. And, uh, uh, and we would benefit from being able to share their stuff. And I really admire his business smarts. I just, because I wouldn't have guessed it. Yes. Rick. Well, having been born in 1953, I'm wondering why else things started sliding down. Oh. <laughs> you tell us. <laughs> for, me it's, for me, it's an arbitrary date. Uh, the, um, um, I prefer a Unitarian Universalism that's deep rather than fashionable. And, and I actually think that we have a rich period where, really from, from Gannett, from the 1880s until sort of the middle 1950s, which is the peak of what, what was the, the liberal religion phase, where there was a sense among Unitarians and Universalists both that they were part of something bigger than just their denominational brand, and that that something bigger was liberal religion. So in the 1950s, you have Waldemar Argo uh, uh, writing. And so I kind of, I, I create in my mind this, this idealized uh, uh, relationship from Gannett to Argo uh, as being the period where I think we really blossomed in terms of theological depth and theological innovation. And since then, we've been more likely to turn to fashion. So that, that you know, what, what, it's like our attention span started to shrink in the mid-1950s as did the whole cultures, you know, in fairness. And, and so, for me, it's just an idealization. Ruth? Uh, from a historic, historian's point of view, what do you think is the next big thing? I, I have spent what I hope is the first half of my life uh, routinely telling Unitarian Universalists that it's actually about more than community. Right? So, you know, I, I love the theological stuff, although I've kind of reached the stage where I'm beginning to think that's less important than I once thought it was. But, but I, but I constant, constantly push back against people who just want to organize our congregations around communities of congenial people. Because my experience of communities of congenial people is that we surround ourselves with those who never challenge us and who never force us to examine the privilege we have, in the case of most Unitarian Universalists, uh, or, or to get serious about the real problems in the world. So, so we have used the ideology of community, I think, as a way of preserving our individualism and individual comfort. And so I've kind of pushed back and rebelled about that, against that. I think the next big thing is community. <laughs> that, that we, this is actually one area where I am in perfect harmony with uh, the current president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, Peter Morales who points to the fact that we are likely the loneliest generation in human history. That, that, that our society, uh, that, that increasingly the, the studies of human interaction and relationships uh, suggest that, that we are becoming an increasingly lonely people, although we're actually lulled into thinking that we have a personal relationship with Anderson Cooper uh, on, on CNN, so that that kind of palliates some of the pain of our isolation and loneliness. But I actually think that here we are in an age where we have the most marvelous communications technologies ever imagined. We have greater capacity to, to interact with one another, not just on, on the same street or in the same house, but around the globe than we've ever had. And human beings are more isolated and disconnected from one another than they've ever been. And I actually think that's the fundamental spiritual problem to solve in the next generation. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm having to change my heart. That's a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> more? Yes, Linda. I know, Steve, and you mentioned somebody you were in love with for the first oh. part. You didn't give a name. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You gave it for Peter. Yeah. 
Jenny McCain. Oh, that's I, so let me tell you about Jenny McCain. <laughs> the, the, Jenny McCain died in 1918, so this is an unrequited love. <laughs> although... There is the spirit world. Although... I, <laughs> although I, I, do, I do like to think that Jenny had people like me in mind when she was going about creating uh, churches for my ancestors. Um, but, but I actually, Jenny uh, died in 1918. She, she left here for Winnipeg. She actually became her husband's successor when she was widowed. So you have to understand, Jenny, this, this woman born in Francistown, New Hampshire, uh, who as a youngster uh, was her father's sidekick in the abolitionist movement. Uh, before coming here to St. Paul. She goes to Winnipeg. She ends up preaching for over a year to a congregation of people who speak only Icelandic. <laughs> and she spoke only English. Um, she actually, as far as I can tell, was the first woman ever to address a mixed public audience in the city of Winnipeg. Uh, founded the Humanist Society in, in Winnipeg in the 1890s. So, so she just says, Magnificent figure who then left to nurse her sister to her grave back in New England. So she returned full circle uh, to, to New England, wrote poetry both here. She has a wonderful poem about Sunday at Minnetonka Lake. Uh, that's, that's a wonderful poem to share. And one, another wonderful verse about the, um, uh, about the Little Wanderers. It's a story that I think happened in Northampton, Massachusetts that she wrote about while she was here in St. Paul, uh, about a, uh, uh, <laughs> I'll get to it, but about a, a couple of children, poor children in the community who were homeless. And a winter storm hit uh, the, the city, and I believe it's Northampton, I think I've pinpointed it. Uh, and, and in the morning, the, uh, uh, this little boy and his younger sister were found on the steps of the, the most fabulous mansion in the city, he was dead. And his scarf and hat were wrapped around his sister's feet, and she was alive. So Jenny uh, wrote a poem about it, which ends with the lines, Oh, human love that spark divine in every heart is found, and clothed in purple or in rags it lives on holy ground. And you cannot read a poet of, of that quality and know her story without just falling in love with her. And so she died in Northampton, Massachusetts, had a memorial service which by her own instructions did not include a eulogy because she felt that her life had not been worthy of a eulogy. And, and I, visited, I visited Chelmsford where she's buried four times in search of her grave before I found it so that I could take her roses. So I'm in love with Jenny McCann. <laughs> you, truly, you truly do give our, our history a sense of the personal um, in a way that's really moving. Thank you. Um, so Gannett left here. He went to Hinsdale, Illinois, and became the publisher of the Unity magazine, and went from there to Rochester, New York, where he became minister of First Unitarian Church in Rochester, New York, and converted Susan B. Anthony, who became a very passionate, uh, dedicated member of that congregation, and he became the chaplain of the suffragists. Um, he was a, a remarkable man. Um, a collection of his writings and a brief biography is about to be published. Um, Shelley Butler, uh, a member of our church, has has been working on this for some time, so watch for that. That's coming out soon. And uh, wow, you could, call, you could call that chapter Genesis in your collective congregational Bible. We could, we could indeed. Or maybe it's Exodus, but it, but <laughs> we could indeed. Thank you so much for being here. This was such a rich, such a rich morning. Thank you, Stefan, for coming on such short notice. Thanks to the education team of the denominational relations ministry team. Thank you very much. We look forward to uh, future uh, opportunities in this uh, amazing story. And uh, have, 
Have fun, take good care, and uh, thanks for being here.